Good morning. I would invite you now to turn to the call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us worship God. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Let us pray. Almighty God, through your only Son you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection may through the renewing power of your Spirit arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we turn to our virtual choir for music this morning. pray. Gracious God, for you all hearts are open. To you all minds are visible. 
And to you, grace from you, grace comes. So that to these visible minds and open hearts, your word might flow. So we ask this day that to our open hearts and our freed wills, you give us the grace to hear through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, verses 26 to 48. We have read in prior weeks of John and how John perceived the Disciples seeing Jesus after the resurrection. This is Luke's version. So listen while we read from the Gospel of Luke. This is Jesus, or this is a part of an encounter between Jesus and two disciples who are, at the time Jesus meets them, on their way away from Jerusalem. And so we read, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened us to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses to these things. Now let's take a few moments in silent reflection over this reading. We might want to think how we have met Christ in our lives. Let us do this in silence.
And now, Lord, our God, as we come to you, as we open our hearts to you, fill our hearts with your love that we might know your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our second reading today is from the letter of John in chapter 3, John's first letter, the first 10 verses. Good morning. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this reason, the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the desert. devil. Sorry. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Here ends the readings. Thanks be to God. Trust in God, but tie up your camel. That's an ancient Mideast proverb. And it has a ring of truth, I think, for all of us. Trust in God, but tie up your camel. You see, and I think some of you will rebel at this, and some of you will tell me, well, I have believed all my life, or you will tell me, I have been a Christian as long as I can remember. But on the whole, we do not easily believe in God. We do not easily trust God. And that is why we tie up our camels. It is, and I think it's becoming more difficult to keep God real keep God present in our life. And so what we usually do is we have two separate lives. And this is backed up by reams and reams of research that we think with two parts of our mind. We have two separate ways of believing and thinking. We have the list could go on and on. But I think we've all experienced this, that we walk out the door of the church and everything changes and we forget. We separate God and our faith and our worship from our daily life. Tanya Lorman, who, she has a great TEDx talk. Uh, She's also published her recent book is How God Becomes Real she makes a statement that religious beliefs are always secondary to what we know about the everyday natural world. 
and the everyday world always matters, always comes first. And he, here are three examples that she gives. She says, we always stop at stoplights unless you've driven in the Middle East. They don't always stop at stoplights. <laughs> okay. But we always stop at stoplights. We always or nearly always study for exams and we feed the dog. Okay. None of us disconnects the brakes in our car and hopes and prays that it will stop at the next stoplight, right? None of us. We'd be insane to do that. None of us turn in a paper or our homework blank and pray that the professor or teacher will see our wonderful work on it, right? And we don't expect the dog's disc to be filled simply through prayer. And by the way, when I think it was Pope John had a heart attack, they did not stop at the chapel and pray over him. They rushed him right to the best hospital in Rome. Point being that in our daily life, we separate God out from the practicality of living. And we've all experienced this. I'm as guilty as everybody else. I do have trouble with the breaking. <laughs> uh, but today, I, I hope through this, really just mostly the first verse in, in the first John passage, I'd like to make God a little bit more real to us. And in some ways, this will be one of the most difficult, at least emotionally difficult, sermons I've ever preached. So bear with me as I start to develop this. But our, our text begins, our, our reading in 1 John begins, See what kind of love the Father has given to us. And the word see has roots closer to examine kind of love God has given us or take some time and sit down and think deeply about the kind of love God has given us. Meditate upon the kind of love God has given us and see it in its greater depth. See more about what God has given us. That this is a very specific love. And the word, the Greek word used for love, and this is the last time I hope I'll mention Greek today, is a word that secular Greek did not use, but New Testament Greek does use, which is in itself a sign of a specific and a unique love. I think there's two or three times outside the New Testament they find it. Uh, that's not that important. So this, this very first Love is a very specific love that God asks us to examine. And for a second, I'm going to step aside and say what it is not. Okay. It is not a love that is selfish. It is not a love that exists for my benefit. It is not a love that fulfills my desires. Okay. It's not the kind of love that's given for accomplishments. As when someone says, I will love you if you get an A on your exam, son. It's not that kind of love. Or I will love you if you can get your weight down to what it was in high school at 102 pounds. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's not that kind of love. It's not the kind of love that expects something of someone before you will grant them any affection. And it's not the kind of love that must be reciprocated. I'll love you, you love me, and we'll feel good, warm, and fuzzy forever. It's not that kind of love. Nor is it love that must be earned in any sense. And this is what we're too often too used to. But God's love exists on a totally different plane or a different order of existence from this. Um, God's love flows from God to us 
in Christ. And it's given as a gift. See what kind of love the Father has given us. It comes as gift. It comes unexpected. It comes freely. It's not earned. It's just there. It's also a love that unites, that draws together, that can be reciprocated without expectation as well. Augustine, in some of his greatest works, says that we learn to love God simply for who God is, with no expectations. We simply learn to love God. And it's a love that, because of these first two pieces, is a love of eternal power that constantly draws together, constantly unites, constantly is given freely. You see, God's love is radically different. It reaches out to us. It overflows from God. It's so abundant that that's the only thing that can happen. It's, it's this love where God takes the initiative to love God's children. It's a love that gives lavishly and freely to those of us who are utterly undeserving of it. And it gives us new life. How can we see this? Here I'd like to share two images. And this, this came in on, on one of my news feeds. And it struck me with some impact. The first picture is a picture of an infant, just born. All of us, I trust, have been impacted by what it is like to hold a newborn baby that is totally helpless, totally dependent upon us. And we love them simply because we love them. There's, there's something there that draws love out of us with a child that has done nothing but be born, so to speak, and yet it's there. So the first image of this newborn infant, the second image is of a young teenage girl and it's a picture of her, she's asleep in bed, and she's hugging this huge, huge teddy bear that's nearly as big as she is. And there are, I suppose, millions of pictures like this. But these two show the infant's first breath and the teenager she became drawing her last breath. And as I thought about these, I thought, I cannot understand the pain that that man must have suffered in taking this picture. But I think there's something of it in Jesus crying at Lazarus' tomb because this is not the way things are supposed to be. And these two images drifted in and out of my mind all week. I would sit down and there they were. And I could not and I cannot shake them. It's almost as if they've taken a kind of possession as I try to understand another's pain and as I try to understand another person's love. And that great searing pain that comes with loss and also a kind of peace that we can't put our fingers on. Almost a contradiction there, the peacefulness and beauty it's a very odd feeling 
as you start to delve into it. And I came to think that we all, not exactly, but in some degree, can understand and share the pain of this parent. Because we've all felt this. We've all been impacted by this. This great love for an infant and the same great love for another person. To the degree that a human being can I think this is our connection to God. Who has this great, overflowing, abundant love for us. Who looks upon each newborn child and each born again human with love and anticipation. And yet, sometimes over the course of a life, the world will block out that love so that it cannot be received. And sometimes it is the church that blocks out that love so that it cannot be received. And this must cause God great pain to see his children at the point where they can no longer receive this love or reciprocate it. This pain of loss. And so here I think we can share, again, to the degree that we are human and can understand with God and God's love for humanity, for the world, for each of us. And so I, I pushed this image a little bit further and dug a little bit deeper into my psyche. You know how we tend to bury things that we are uncomfortable with? And I ask myself, how did I come to this conclusion? How is it that I see or feel or know God's love in Christ. And once again, I'd like to share two images with you. First, we have pictures of my sister as an infant. Not a lot, but we have a few. And second, after mom died and we were cleaning out the house, my brother found a picture of her. And she is standing there with a teddy bear just before she died of leukemia. And I think that this has formed me and informed me of how God loves. Great joy and great pain. I would suggest as difficult as it is that you search yourselves for these points where you can understand or you can see in your life, this same kind of great love which God has given to us. Let us pray. Holy God, we will say we cannot understand, but to the degree that we can, let us see this great love which you have for us in Christ. Amen.
Let's sing together now, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. This is printed in the bulletin for us. Before we go to our time of prayer, um, I have requests this morning for Irma, who is back in the hospital, and Al Moorhead, who is also in the hospital. So please let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, we know that your great love overflows from out of eternity into our limited time. And we know that you give each of us an allotted time on this earth and that throughout this time, your love never leaves us. And so we come to you today asking that you bless us first by your grace and second by understanding how great this love is. We ask that you strengthen us in all our days so that we can meet the joys and we can meet the pain and we can bring them together and begin to understand how you must have felt when you looked and saw your son on the cross. That a world ravaged by guilt and sorrow would put him there. And yet you still love us. And so we thank you for staying with us and guiding us and opening our lives, often in new and strange and difficult ways. Lead us forward in these times that we might know step by step the pathway to follow. In the difficulties and challenges of our lives, let us turn to you and let us keep you real, not just here, not just now when we feel your presence, when we feel the Holy Spirit push upon us, but in the mo movement and moments of our life, let us see in each act of love we encounter your presence. 
And so we would pray for Art and Irma, for Bev Tagliati, Amy Teal, Tara, Thomas, Linda Wengert, Neil and June Weister, Terry Weister, Bruce Wise, Kate Wolford, Steve Zervini and his helicopter crew, Greg Davis and Pine Springs Camp, those gripped by addictions and those who serve in the military. We pray, O oh Lord, for this world and this country and your church. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we pause for a few moments. Let's take a moment to stir ourselves, move a little as we prepare for our congregational meeting. <laughs> 